you're visiting with us here this morning, we're so glad you're here with us. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us here this morning. We pray that our singing and our fellowship will enrich you spiritually. And we have the opportunity now, as we do every week, to open the Bible together. If you'll take your Bible and turn with me to Romans 8, 28, I want to bring a message from just this one verse. It's one of the most familiar, uh, best-loved verses in the Bible. In fact, many of you know it. I hope you can quote it. It's a great verse to memorize. That great verse says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. My prayer is God will make this passage of Scripture very real to our hearts here this morning. Back in uh, December of last year, a couple months ago, uh, Bob Green uh, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, and um, it was a commentary about a very unconventional ninth grade graduation speech that was given by uh, Chief Justice John Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court. And now he gave the speech back in June of 2017 at his son's school. I mean, his son was graduating from the, the Cardigan Mountain School. It's a New Hampshire boarding school for boys in the 6th to the ninth grade. So Chief Justice Roberts' son was graduating uh, there, and so he's asked to give this commencement speech. A very modest crowd evidently was there, not a large group of people. And his, his speech was uh, unconventional, to say the least. Here's a little bit of what he said. I thought I'd share this with you this morning. He got up and said this, Commencement speakers will typically wish you good luck and extend good wishes to you. I will not do that, and I'll tell you why. From time to time in the years to come, I hope you'll be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope you'll suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you'll be lonely from time to time so you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time. Now, I don't believe in bad luck. These are his words, but... He says, I wish you bad luck again from time to time so you'll be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It's a great way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. I hope you'll be ignored so that you'll know the importance of listening to others. And I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. And then he said this, whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen. I like that, right? That's life, right? But then he says this, and, and, and whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. Now, as you can see, that's where I got the title for this morning's message. I've titled this message, The, the Meaningful Message in Misfortunes. And Chief Justice Roberts says, whether you benefit from these things or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. There's few things in life more important than seeing the message in your misfortune in life. Because every one of us here suffer misfortune in life. We have sufferings, trials, tribulations, uh, difficulties, and we all face suffering. I don't know what you're going through here today. But God does. And the good news is, God not only knows what's happening in your life, God knows where it's going. God knows where it's headed. God sees it all. And I think all of us recognize here today, and I think I recognize this in my life even more the older I get, and that is how narrow and small and limited my perspective really is. I think the older we get, we realize that the scope of our, our wisdom and our knowledge and our understanding is so limited. We easily stumble over the messages in our misfortunes in life. But I think there's no greater verse to, to help us understand this overarching, meaningful message in our misfortune than Romans 8.28. It's arguably the greatest, most comprehensive promise in the Bible. Now, amazingly, this promise is very brief. In fact, in the New American Standard that I quoted from earlier, it's 27 words. Um, several other popular New Testament translations are 23 words, but in the original Greek, it's 16 words. That's how brief and compact it is. And here's the other thing about this verse. It's made up of the plainest one-syllable words in the English language. I mean, they're words any first grader could read. Uh, notice these words, and we know that God causes all. In fact, I think there's three words that actually have more than one syllable. 
They're the simplest words you can imagine. Yet compressed into these simple words is the greatest promise found anywhere in the Bible. And the thing that I want us to, to see this morning and to lay hold of is this is not just a cliché. It's not just kind of a, a snappy slogan that we say to people when they're having problems. Well, you know, you can know that God causes all things to work together for good. It's not just a, a pious platitude. This is a, a precious promise from our sovereign God to us. And, and here's the promise, really. And here's this, this meaningful message that all of us need to grasp in our misfortune. Romans 8.28 is the God-given assurance that if you love God, if you love the Lord, that sooner or later every detail, every situation in your life will work out for your good. Now that's hard for us to lay hold of, isn't it? But it's, it's the, the uh, God-given assurance. If you love the Lord, every circumstance of your life will sooner or later turn out for your good. Now to understand this this morning, to grasp this, to, to have it sink into our hearts, I want to unfold this promise and learn the meaningful message of our misfortune under five points. You can see them there in your outline. They're simple. Uh, there's nothing complicated about these, but I think it'll help us unpack the, the meaning of this verse. Now the first key to this promise and to understanding the, the message in our misfortune is that it's certain. Notice the first words of Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know, and we know. Now, the context of Romans chapter 8 is suffering. If you go back and uh, look at chapter 8 and verse 17, notice what he says there. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. So it's talking here about suffering. Notice the next verse, verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed in us. We live in a world that is suffering, but he goes on down in verse 22 and says this world is groaning. We know the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth till now. And then verse 23, he says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Now, I don't think I have to convince you this morning. We live in a suffering, groaning creation. And all of us suffer. And we groan in our lives at times as well. But there's two common experiences in our suffering that the Apostle Paul mentions here that I don't, don't want us to miss. Look at verse 25. He says, if we hope for what we do not see. The first thing he says when you and I are suffering and we're groaning in life is we do not see. And that's one of the most difficult things in life is when we're, we're suffering and we, we don't see how it all fits together and we don't see the end of it. And then notice in verse 26, he says, we do not know. Now, I don't know about you, but that's how I often feel in the difficulties of life. I do not see and I do not know. The problem is we want to see and we want to know, but we can't. There's so much we don't see and so much we don't know. Why do some people, many here in this church, contract cancer? and suffer so over a long period of time and struggle with that, and others seem to have a relatively good health? Why do some small children die, and others live and live to adulthood, and, and uh, their parents uh, 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 outlive their parents by, by a long period of time? Why do 17 young people lose their lives in Florida in a senseless shooting? I mean, on and on we could go. The problem is we don't see and we don't know. And I often face this in my own times of prayer. I pray for many needs here in this church and our staff. We gather together every Thursday at 10 o'clock and um, talk about the details of our church and our services and all. But one of the things we do is we pray. And the elders at our church, we meet every other Sunday afternoon and we gather together. And one of the things we do is pray. And the list here of needs in our church is long. It's a long list. And those are just the ones we know about. And often when I look at that list and just think about the, uh, the suffering that's going on just here in this body of believers, uh, I struggle with the fact that I don't see and I don't know. And I often find myself thinking, I can't see what God is doing. I don't know what He's doing. A couple of weeks ago, Cheryl and I went and saw the movie Hostels. Um, I love westerns. Cheryl's not that big on them, but she goes and sees them with me. 
Uh, This was a rather grim western. She didn't really like it. She liked the end because it ended kind of happy at the end, but that's about the only part she liked. But it takes place in 1892 in New Mexico, and the movie opens with a scene where some uh, Comanches come and uh, to this home where some settlers live, and uh, the, the husband is killed. This wife is there. Her three small children are killed, her infant baby in her arms. She actually escapes and gets away. Then the, the scene kind of shifts to this fort where there's some soldiers there that are going to take a dying uh, Cheyenne chief to Montana. And the guy that's leading this is named Captain Joe Blocker. And as they go on the way to Montana, they find the burned out ruins of this woman's house and they pick her up and she becomes part of the group as they travel along. And um, all the people in the movie have have suffered a lot of just brutality from that time and that era in the world. It's got some beautiful spiritual undertones though. And at one time they're sitting around the fire at night. There's this African-American soldier there and he's singing an, an old rendition of that great song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. But this Captain Joe Blocker, one of their men gets killed on the way up there in a a confrontation, and he's sitting out there by the fresh grave with his Bible reading. And this young woman whose family's all been killed, her name is Mrs. Rosalind Quaid, she comes out there and begins to talk to him. And he asks her, he says, do you have faith? And she says, well, faith is the only thing that's gotten me through all all these difficulties I've suffered. But then she made a statement that hit me. She said this, we'll never get used to the Lord's rough ways. It's a powerful statement. In this life, we'll never get used to the rough ways of the Lord. We can't see what God is doing, and we don't know all of what God is doing. But I love this. In the context of not seeing and not knowing, in verse 28, we come to something that we can know. I love this. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to the called according to His purpose. It doesn't say here that we feel like all things work together for good because often we don't feel that way. Often we feel the opposite. It doesn't say we hope or we wish all things will work together for good. It says we know. We know that all things work together for good. Look, we can never unravel the mystery of suffering and groaning in life. But thank God there's something we can know. We'll never understand the Lord's rough ways. We'll never get used to the Lord's rough ways. But there's something that you and I can know. And it's certain and it's sure and it's positive. So this is a certain promise of God to be claimed by us. We know Now, the second thing about this promise is it's comprehensive. We know that all things work together for good, or God causes all things to work together. Now, a couple of qualifiers here that are important. One thing, it doesn't say God causes all things. God doesn't cause sin, and God doesn't cause every disaster that occurs. Now, God in His sovereignty has to allow it, but He doesn't cause it. And it also doesn't say here that everything that happens to us is good. Certainly sin is not good. It's evil and wicked. And suffering is often often brutal and shocking. So it doesn't say God causes all things, and it doesn't say that all things are good, but it says that God causes all things to work together for good. And the biggest word in this verse is that word all. Now, we might not have a problem with this if it said, God causes happy things to work together for good. Or God causes good things to work together for good. Or God causes a lot of things to work together for good. Or maybe even if God caused most things to work together for good. But all means all. And and that's our problem in this verse. Our problem is with that that word. But I think nothing is excluded here. There's, There's no asterisk by the word all here. But there's no footnote that clarifies it for us. There's no exceptions, no exemptions, no limitations, no boundaries. It's all things. Personal mistakes, misunderstandings, trials, troubles, illnesses, disappointments, failure, death, adversity, sin, dark things, bright things, happy things, bitter things, bad financial reports, times of prosperity, whatever it is, God weaves the strands of every circumstance and every influence to accomplish His purposes. 
Now, think about this verse. If it didn't say all things, if it said a lot of things or most things or some things, how comforting would that be? And if it's not all-encompassing, then it really doesn't matter. Because if it's just some things, then I don't know what the other things are that God isn't working together. So to me, if it's not all-encompassing, it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant. It has to say all things. So God can take all things, and God can even take the sin and the failure in your life and turn it out for ultimate good. Now, that's a blessing. I I mean, that's a tremendous thing to know. It's not an excuse for us to make a mess of our life and then say, well, God, you just sort it all out. But it's a comfort to know that when we fail and sin, that God can even take that and work it for good. There's a great uh, statement by Warren Wiersbe in uh, his commentary on this where he talks about King David. And this has been a tremendous encouragement to me over the years. He says this. He says, what were David's two greatest sins? Most would reply his adultery with Bathsheba and his taking a census of the people. Remember back then the kings weren't to to count the number of their people or their armies because in doing that it was like they were putting confidence in that rather than in, in God. So David sinned with Bathsheba with adultery and he took a census of the people. And then uh, Wiersbe says this, As a result of David's sin of numbering the people, David ended up purchasing the property on Mount Moriah where he built an altar and worshipped the Lord. Remember, to, to assuage God's anger, he buys that mountain there, Mount Moriah, where he builds an altar for the Lord. And then he says, David married Bathsheba and God gave them a son named Solomon. Now we have Solomon building a temple on David's property on Mount Moriah. God took the consequence of David's two worst sins, a piece of property and a son, and built a temple. And then he says, where grace abounds, or sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And he says, and Wiersbe says this, and hear this this morning, he says, this isn't an encouragement for us to sin, because David paid dearly for both of those transgressions. But it is an encouragement to us to go on serving God after we've repented and confessed our sins. Satan wants us to think that all is lost, but the God of all grace is still at work. Satan, when we sin and we fail, wants us to throw in the towel, but God wants us to confess it and repent and to know that even in that, God can ultimately work it for good. So don't wallow in your mistakes and your failures this morning. Write Romans 8.28 over that page of your life and give your failures to God. Now think about what this passage reveals to us about the person of God. If God is constantly working all things all the time in the life of every believer for their good, what does that tell us about what God must be like? I mean, it cracks our head just to even think about that. God is infinite in His wisdom and His knowledge. He's working every detail in the life of every believer all the time for their good. Only a sovereign God could make this promise. He's got to be all-knowing. He's got to be all-powerful. Only a a sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful God could say this. It would be impossible for God to say this if He wasn't sovereign over all things. So this is an all-inclusive promise from an all-knowing, all-powerful God to you and me. All things work together for our good. There's a a guy from way back in church history named Dr. Bernard Gilpin. He was born in 1517, the same year that Martin Luther sparked the Protestant Reformation. And uh, Bernard Gilpin was uh, a preacher in the British Isles. He was called the Apostle to the North. But his parishioners and the people that knew him well called him the Romans 828 man. Because Anytime anything would happen that was difficult, he would always say, Romans 8, 28, God's going to work all things for good. Now, one day he was traveling, and he broke his leg in an accident. And one of the people there that wasn't a believer mocked him and said, how's it, do you, do you believe you breaking your leg is going to turn out for good? And he responded very quickly, oh, yes, he says, the Bible says all things. Well, as it turns out, His breaking his leg delayed his trip to London where the Queen Bloody Mary had determined to place him on trial for his preaching and have him killed. By the time he was able to resume his journey, Bloody Mary had died. And he was saved from almost certain martyrdom and he lived to serve the Lord for another 25 years. 
So Bernard Gilpin was the Romans 828 man, and we should all be Romans 828 people. May it be said of us and the people around us that we have this kind of a trust in God, that God is taking the all things. He's working it together for good. So this promise is certain. It's a certain promise. It's a comprehensive promise, but it's a continuous promise. Notice he says all things work together. God causes these things to work together. The word work together is the word synergeo. We get the word synergy from that. Things that are working together. And it's in the present tense in the Greek, which means God is constantly always working things together. So in all the mess and the pain and the misfortune and the loss and the failure of life, God is at work. Think about this. The the plan of God is relentlessly unfolding. He's constantly working it together. So nothing is haphazard. Everything is in His hands. Now there's a lot of mystery to this because God's ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55, 9 says it beautifully. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The the ways of God are untraceable. In fact, uh, turn in your Bible over just a page or two to Romans chapter 11. In Romans 11:33, this is the end. This is the culmination of the great doctrinal section of the book of Romans. And we come to this beautiful doxology here at the end of Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable are His ways. God's ways are untraceable is what it's saying here. I like what Spurgeon, though, said years ago, when we can't trace the the, the, uh, hand of God, we can trust the heart of God. And that's a beautiful statement. We can't trace His hand. We can always trust His heart. We should write Romans 11.33 under Romans 8 because that's how it comes to pass. The unsearchable judgments and the unfathomable ways of God. God is constantly working together and weaving together all the threads of life for our good. He's interlacing every strand of your life. And what this means is God's sovereign will is taking place even in your trials and even in your troubles. And if God wished for it to be different, and if it would be better for it to be different, then it would be different. I mean, think about that. If somehow it could be better if it were different, then it would be different. And if God wanted it to be different, it would be different. James Boyce uh, was the pastor at uh, 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for many years. I I mentioned him a few weeks ago. I had the chance to meet him a couple times when he came here and spoke in the area. A wonderful, godly man. On Good Friday of uh, 2000, the year 2000, he found out that he had uh, a very aggressive form of liver cancer. He died uh, just within a few weeks. Um, He made some beautiful statements in those times. But here's one of the comments that James Montgomery Boyce made. And again, this is a man who who knows that he has a a very aggressive form of of liver cancer and is going to die soon. He said this, Everything God does is good. If God does something in your life, would you change it? If you'd change it, you'd make it worse. It wouldn't be good. So that's the way we want to accept it and move forward. And who knows what God will do. Now that's a powerful statement of trust in God, isn't it? He's saying, look, if you want to change something in your life, if you changed it, you'd make it worse. It wouldn't be as good. So that's the way we want to accept it and move forward. Who knows what God uh, will do. So a story I told here years ago about Handley Mole, the great preacher from uh, England. He died in 1920. Um, he was a preacher uh, there and, and preached all around the British Isles. But uh, Handley Mole, one time there was a, 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 a mine, a coal mine, caved in and collapsed. And many men were trapped there and killed. And he was uh, given the task. Some people came and called him to come and talk to these grieving families. Now, you can, can you imagine that? You're there with these families that are grieving, just hearing about the loss of their loved ones. I mean, how would you like for that to be your assignment? But he went there. He believed that God called him to go and to minister to them. He said some things, but here's the the main core of what he said. He said, it's very difficult for us to understand why God would let an awful disaster happen. But we know him and we trust him. 
and all will be right. I have at home an old bookmarker given to me by my mother. It's worked in silk, and when I examine the bottom side of it, I see nothing but a tangle of threads. It looks like a big mistake. One would think that someone had done it who did not know what she was doing. When I turn it over and look at the right side, I see there beautifully embroidered on that bookmark the letters, God is love. We're looking at all of this today from the underneath side. Someday we'll see it from another standpoint and we will understand. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day when we'll see it from the the top side. We'll see it from uh, the heavenly side. But in the meantime, this passage tells us that all night, all day, right now, God is constantly available, covering every contingency, working everything together all the time. In fact, uh, Robert Morgan says it like this, Romans 8.28 is a banner suspended over every Christian's life. It's printed on our birth certificate when we're born, and it's inscribed on our tombstone when we die. It's the banner for our lives. God's promise here is continuous. Now, another thing about this promise, it's constructive. He says it's for good. God works all things together for good. This means that God has a positive uh, purpose in view. This is beneficial. Everything works for good. In fact, uh, John Murray, a great commentator on Romans, I read his commentary on this this week, and he says this, not one detail ultimately works for evil to the people of God. That's powerful, isn't it? That's wonderful. Not one detail works ultimately for evil to the people of God. And then he says, in the end, only good will be their lot. Now, the problem is, often we feel the opposite of that, don't we? We feel the opposite of that in life. In fact, there's a verse back in the Old Testament that is the polar opposite of Romans 8.28. Now, if you don't want to turn there with me, write this down. It's Genesis 42.36. You might want to go back and read it uh, this week. Genesis 42.36, and it's the story of Jacob. Now, remember, this is later in Jacob's life, and he thinks his son Joseph is dead. He's thought that now for decades. His sons sold him into slavery to the Egyptians, uh, to the Midianites who took him to Egypt, but he thinks he's dead. Of course, Joseph's actually there in Egypt, and he's kept one of Jacob's other sons, Simeon, there. And he's demanded that the youngest son, Benjamin, be brought there as well. And Jacob is filled with fear and he's filled with anxiety. He's overwhelmed. And he says to his sons in verse 36 of Genesis 42, You bereave me of my children. Joseph is no more. That's what he believes. Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Now, if you live long enough in life, every one of us get to the place where sometime in the heart of hearts we think, everything's against me. And here when Jacob says, everything is against me, actually, as it turns out, everything that seemed to be against him was actually for him. Joseph wasn't dead. He was actually in Egypt being used by God to save their family. Simeon would live. Benjamin would live. Everything he thinks is against him. God is working for him. So I encourage you the next time that life has you down and you're sitting around discouraged and downcast and depressed thinking everything in life is against me. If you can just lift up your head and remember this message today and remember Romans 8.28, God is saying everything you think is against you is actually for you. God is working it for your good. Now, what is the good here in Romans 8, 28? God's going to work everything for our good. Does that mean we'll always be happy and ultimately everything will work out the way we like it? Well, good here is defined by God. And the good here, I think, is that Christ might be seen and glorified in our lives. That's the good. Ultimately, the good here is for us to be like Christ. If you'll notice the very next verse... For him he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. The ultimate work and purpose of God in your life and in my life is to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus. That is the good in our lives. And God is working everything for good. Here's a, a, a quote by Charles Spurgeon. If you know anything about Spurgeon's life, the great preacher... Um, He had his his share of difficulties and struggles in life. He said, everything that happens to you is for your good. 
If the waves roll against you, it's to speed your ship toward the port. If lightning and thunder comes, it's to clear the atmosphere and promote your soul's health. You gain by loss, you grow healthy in sickness. You live by dying, you're made rich in losses. Could you ask for a better promise? It is better that all things should work for my good than all things should be as I wish to have them. All things might work for my pleasure and yet all might work to my ruin. If all things do not always please me, they will always benefit me. This is the best promise of this life. But Romans 8.28 is not just a miscellaneous motto. We just kind of pull it out and people frame it and put it in their house or quote it to other people when they're having problems. It's not just some miscellaneous motto. It's embedded here into the context of Romans. And Romans 8, 29, and 30, the two verses after it, show how everything works together for good. It's not just fate or luck. It's according to the divine purpose and the divine decree of God. Notice these great words, whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Romans 8.28 is an anchor for our souls that's held in place by the unbreakable chain of God's plan of salvation. These five words, predestined, foreknown, called, justified, glorified, are often called the five great golden links in the chain of salvation. What God has done in eternity past, He foreknowing and predestining, He brings to bear in time by calling us and justifying us, and it ultimately leads to our glorification someday in heaven. But did you notice here, all of these are past tense. Even glorified is in the past tense. He glorified us. Now, I can look around here. I don't think anybody here has been glorified this morning. Um, I certainly haven't been. But He says it in the past tense. The one who called us and who justified us He will glorify us. We will be glorified. Another thing I want you to notice is it's what J. Vernon McGee used to say. There's no seepage in God's program. If He foreknew you, you get predestined. If you get predestined, you get called. If you get called, you get justified. And if you get justified, you get glorified. It's airtight. There's no seepage in this program of God. And that is the purpose of God, if you will, the divine decree and purpose that backs up this promise. In fact, someone said it beautifully like this. There's a chain of five golden links forged from eternity past in the blacksmith's shop of the sovereignty of the eternal God that anchors the promise of Romans 8.28. It's an unbreakable chain, if you will, forged in the fires of the eternal decrees of God. God is working all things for our good to accomplish His ultimate purpose to make us like His Son. There's a fifth facet to this promise, and that is it's conditional. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, this is where we come to what I call the fine print. As great as this promise is, it's not for everyone. This is not a universal promise for every person. You have to meet a requirement. There's a key contingency here. There's a boundary. There's a a key condition that must be met. I love the way it's stated here in the Greek. You have all things work together for good, but before that statement and after that statement, you have two statements that limit its applicability. Let me tell you what I mean here. Here's how you'd really translate this in Greek. And we know that to those who love God, all things work together for good, to those who are called according to His purpose. So notice God works all things together for good is bracketed by the statement to those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. To those who love God looks at it from the human perspective. Our response to Him, we love Him. But to those who are called according to His purpose looks at the divine initiative in bringing us uh, to salvation. So this promise is only to those who love God. And that's in the present tense in the Greek, which means we have a vital, ongoing love of God. And why do we love God? Well, 1 John tells us we love Him because He first loved us. We love God because God has loved us and sent His Son to be our Savior. And the, the, the other reason we love God is because God has called us according to His purpose. 
The fact that God has called me and made me His own, my response now to the divine initiative and gracious action of God in my life is for me then uh, to love Him. So let me ask you a question this morning. Has the call of God reached you in your life? Have you responded to that call of God? I like to put it like this. God is calling you to call upon Him. Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So the call of God in the life of a sinful person is a call from God for that person to call upon Him, to call upon God for His mercy and His grace to save them uh, from their sins. If you've never done that, why not respond to that call this morning? If God is calling you this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you need to call upon Him. He'll wash away your sins. He'll forgive you. He'll give you eternal life. And God will write the banner of Romans 8.28 over your life. And all things in your life will work together uh, for your good. John Broadus is a well-known preacher from the past. Uh, he uh, died uh, around uh, the late 1800s, but um, he was the president of Southern um, Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. But he uh, preached a sermon years ago back in 1890 in the Woodward Avenue Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. It was just a few years before he died. He preached on this passage, and he closed his sermon with these words. And I want to close the sermon this morning with these words of his. He says, if you had your way, you'd have no wants ungratified. Life would be all pleasure. No rude winds would blow, and no chilling blasts would touch the cheek of those you love. But life is complex, and hard times come. Yet we know from Romans 8.28 that all things, the pleasant, the sad, the helpful, and the severe, are working together for good to those who love God. We cannot fully understand now but when we stand upon the heights of glory, we will look back with joy on the things we have suffered, for we will know then that our severest trials were a part of the all things that work together for our eternal good. That's the meaningful message in our misfortune. That for those of us who love the Lord, every detail of our lives will sooner or later work out for our good. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we come now this morning, we thank you for loving us first, for calling us according to your purpose. Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who's never responded to your gracious call, that they might do so now, that they might call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And Father, I pray for all of us here this morning, myself included, that you'll make the promise of Romans 8.28 real and accessible in our lives when we need it most. Oh, Father, when we're brought to our knees, help this promise to be accessible to us, not to be far away, but close and meaningful and real. And I pray that through this promise, we'll find peace and hope and comfort as we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>